Why do they keep getting our hopes up? I'm tired of this. Every win they get while still out of a playoff spot gets us one step away from taking a machete to this roster and getting younger. Yeah, and a decision gets taken out of your hands when you hang on to assets that have been mainstays on the roster. You love them for what they've done, but know it's time to move on. And by hanging on to them for too long, you risk them getting injured like tonight. And then you get it taken out of your hand that they're not going to get traded this season, are they? Preds allow the Vancouver Canucks to tie this game 4-4 in regulation and then this will be the quickest everybody's hands go up here see here we go everybody's hands go up as the nashville predators defeat the vancouver canucks won nothing in the gimmick also known as a shootout and win the game overall five four tuesday night inside bridgestone arena in one of the most agonizing annoying games of the season a game where the Preds had a 2-0 lead and a 4-2 lead. The Preds somehow managed to escape with the hair of their chinny chin chin in a game they should have won very comfortably. Oh yeah, and don't let me forget to mention, Preds fans, I was wholeheartedly rooting for the Canucks in this game. And as were my Canucks friends, because remember, I'm in Vancouver. They were all texting me today saying that they were rooting for the Preds to win this game. So, uh, all's well overall as it usually is. Not much going on in the first four minutes or so of the first period until Puck is in the Canucks zone in Colin Delia's crease for the Vancouver Canucks. C Colton Sissons is whacking away at the puck and he decides to get a better angle and passes it to the young kid who keeps making the lineup even though it's astounding Preds fans Cole Smith is able to bang away at a different angle, get it past Delia, his third of the season, and gives the Preds a 1-0 lead. Wait, hold up. Canucks coach Rick Tockett wants to challenge this for being offside. And as of late, more goals for the offside challenge have been overturned than have been allowed to stand because the video judges for each franchise have been getting better at knowing if a goal should be waived off for offside. And I know the Sportsnet broadcast was disappointed by this as a lot of Canucks friends of mine were on social media, but Tanner Janot's right skate wasn't completely in the Canucks zone when the puck has already entered. So because of that, you are allowed to drag one foot and not be considered completely in the zone. Because of that, that is why the goal stands and the Preds have a 1-0 lead. Preds unable to convert on the bench minor that is assessed to the Canucks because of the failed challenge. And then the Canucks get a power play of their own on a Dante Fabro hooking call about nine minutes into the first. And they're also unable to convert. Preds are turning on the pressure with about six minutes left to go in the first period. Being a little too aggressive, Roman Yossi draws a goalie interference call. The Canucks come close, are not able to convert. They do outshoot the Preds 13 to 8. They would go on to outshoot the Preds overall for the game, but the Preds hold their own despite being outshot and maintain a 1 0 lead after first. And I would just like to say congratulations to former Preds captain Mike Fisher on the news that he will be inducted into T T Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. Well deserved. Long time into the second period with Norwistle, the Canucks with the early edge in shots. Then the Preds would get their first great chance. Tanner Janot, who gets a partial break on Colin Delia, but he's unable to extend the Preds lead. On a Preds power play, Canucks the Giuseppe, I hope I said that right, he's able to get a breakaway, but is unable to beat Saros. But soon after, the Preds would be heard from. After a faceoff win in the neutral zone with the Preds still on the power play, Philip Tomasino takes the puck and skates into the Canucks zone. He gives it over to Yusuf Parson as he races towards the net and is able to outflank both Tyler Myers and JT Miller and gets the puck back from 
useful person, and he's able to bang it home past Delia to give the Preds a 2 nothing lead. That is full of Tomasino's long-awaited first goal of the season. And I didn't even touch off the top of this recap that I like, for once in a long while, the lines that John Hines constructed for this game. Yes, these two were playing together on the power play unit, but they were also the second line along with Nito Niederreiter. Tomasino and Yuso Parson should be playing together on an NHL line since they have such chemistry that they built down in Milwaukee. And if they don't work with Niederreiter, you can easily put in Cody Glass there or Tommy Novak. This doesn't let John Hines off the hook, not by a long shot, but you better keep number 26 and number 75 together moving forward for a bit here. Friends, as it would turn out, are not out of the woods yet because just over seven minutes left to go in the middle frame. Preds are pinching Ekholm a little bit too much that he tends to do sometimes along with Yossi at other times and the puck goes the other way. Kuzmenko on a breakaway and somebody like him is not going to miss this opportunity. He beats Soros, cutting the Preds lead to 2-1. There's three minutes left to go in the second period. Scary moment as the Bally Sports camera catches Ryan Johansson having to be helped down the runway to the Preds dressing room. He couldn't do it under his own strength. And the replay on the ice showed that behind the Canucks net, Quinton Hughes falls and incidentally, his skate cuts something on Ryan Johansson's back ankle or his foot. Hopefully he had Kevlar there so it's not too severe. Obviously he wasn't bleeding. But you got to think he's probably going to be out for a while, if not the season. So there goes one trade asset, at least at the trade deadline. We'll see what happens in the offseason. Hopefully I'm wrong and he's not out for the rest of the season. But I'm bracing myself for the worst news. Though the Preds will be playing with 11 forwards for the rest of this game. Canucks with a late period. Power play. Preds trying to hang on for dear life. But... Canucks keep it in the zone, keep the pressure on. Charles thinks he has the puck covered, but Sheldon Dries is able to get a greasy goal in around Charles, tying this game at two with 22 seconds left to go in the middle frame. But props to the Preds after the Canucks have tied the game. They don't quit and they go right off of the ensuing faceoff after the tying goal into the Canucks zone. Preds are attacking en masse. Tommy Novak gets the puck on net that goes behind the net and he goes in to find it. And he gets the puck back out front to number 22, Nito Niederreiter, who keeps the puck backhand and wraps it around and past Colin Dillia to restore the Preds lead. They're back up 3-2. They hang on to this lead after 40 minutes. And let's get into the chaos that was the third period. Present Canucks continue to trade chances through the first quarter of the third period. Preds content to give the Canucks shots from distance, so it's nothing too hard for Soros to see and stop. Canucks' best chance early comes about six minutes into the third period, but Soros is able to clamp down, shut the door, and maintain the Preds' lead. Almost eight minutes into the third period, Preds can sense the Canucks getting closer. The Preds find a second gear and are able to generate the offense with number eight, Cody Glass, finding his square root partner in crime, number 64, Mikael Grenon, only his seventh goal of the season. Boy, you wish he had more. Maybe the Preds would be in a much more comfortable playoff spot. That seventh goal of the season gives the Preds a 4-2 lead. You gotta think it's safe lead now, right? Do I really need to go through the next portion of the game? No, let's get to the fun part and let's fast forward to about three minutes left to go in regulation. Preds still up for two. Canucks pull Colin Delia, so they'll have six men on the ice. Let me not forget that at this moment, Tanner Janot is serving a hooking penalty, so it's technically a six on four, but one step at a time, the Preds kill off the hooking penalty, so they're back to even strength, even though the Canucks still have six on five advantage. After an icing call, the Canucks are able to get healthy, rested guys on the ice. Preds stuck with tired guys, and under 90 seconds left to go, the clock ticks down and down, and you're getting nervous about the Canucks' pressure and if the Preds are going to survive. 
then with just over a minute left oh here we go just over a minute left puck just inside the blue line along the left wing board Quinton Hughes with a shot that Connor Garland is able to tip past Soros cutting the Preds lead to 4-3 but then there's like 30 seconds left and the Preds have the puck in the Canucks zone can they just keep it in there nope they can't Bouvillier carries the puck out he gets it over to JT Miller not all the Canucks are skating back not all the Preds Players are falling back on defense like they should to prevent what is about to come. JT Miller carries the puck. A couple Preds defenders falling back. Kuzmenko is racing towards the goal. JT Miller labels it just right for Kuzmenko to tip it past Soros. Oh my god, the Canucks have come back to tie this game 4-4. Only 30 seconds into overtime, Kuzmenko already has a chance for the hat trick to put this game away and he fans on his shot. Nita Runner and Novak with a great cycle, but the three minute mark since they're having to pick up the slack because Ryan Johansson, who would be essential regularly in overtime, cannot be out there to help his team. Then once again, every Preds fan's heart skips a beat as JT Miller hits the crossbar behind Soros. This game's still tied at four somehow. Canucks take a penalty in the last minute, and instead of getting the puck to touch a Canucks player's stick or just get a shot on goal so he can get a timeout and set up properly, no, the Preds decide to skate around with the extra man and you know, heaven forbid they pass it back and it goes into their own net. You'd rather have a goalie back there. I don't know why they just didn't try to get a stoppage so they could set up properly. They thought they could just do it on their own. These players on this team seem to do that a lot this season. That's why they're kind of in the predicament they're in in the standings. Finally, there's a stoppage with three and a half seconds left to go in overtime. Yeah, that's a lot of time to try and get a winner there. Obviously, they don't convert on a power play. The overtime ends, and we're off to the gimmick, also known as the shootout. First up, Gremlin is stopped by Dilia. Kuzmenko tries to get Soros to bite for the Canucks, but he shuts the door, so it's scoreless after one round of the shootout. Second round, Matt Duchesne looks like he's going to go five hole, and Dilia shuts that, but Duchesne tricks him, gets it in under his glove. The Preds take a 1 0 lead in the shootout because on the Canucks' second attempt, JT Miller, a la Bo Horvat in the Preds' shootout victory in Vancouver back in November, is not able to get a shot off in time before Charles is able to deny whatever the heck he was trying. But when Yossi has a chance to end it before the Canucks even get a chance with their third shooter, he can't beat Delia. And then, finally, it's Ellis Pedersen, and I totally thought he was going to go off the Forsberg because he's tried that before and he has beaten Sarles with it back before COVID in a uh, Preds loss in Vancouver. He doesn't do that. Somehow Sarles stops him as Pedersen tried to go up over his shoulder. Preds win the shootout one nothing and win this crazy hockey game 5-4. So how are we feeling after that chaos? Preds nation angry frustrated, a little bit happy. I can totally understand all three feelings, but at this point in the season, this far out of a playoff spot, you want to be a spoiler. You don't want to give yourself a false sense that you might climb back into things when you get victories like this, and it's a shootout victory. Heaven forbid you get into a tie because this is another victory that counts for nothing because they go for regulation and overtime wins first if there's a tie in points. The Preds got no help on the out of town score but if you didn't see because Minnesota won so the Preds are still seven points out of a playoff spot despite having two games in hand so this does them no help. The next four games before the trade deadline are not going to be a good gauge at where this team is as they have San Jose in San Jose a very winnable game but I thought this would be a very winnable game in regulation then you've got at Arizona in that college-like atmosphere on Sunday and you've already proven to me that Arizona can beat you straight up and then you've got old faithful from six years ago that Preds Nation can't let go, understandably, and some players on the roster probably still remember it well. Pittsburgh comes to town on Tuesday night. They're fighting for their playoff lives in the Eastern Conference. And then you go to Florida, who doesn't want to be the butt of jokes if their pick 
ends up in a lottery and ends up going to Montreal. At this rate, Preds fans hope that Ryan Johansson is not hurt long term and also hope that David Poyle gets some reasonable offers for players on this roster so we don't lose out on everything. No playoffs and nothing coming back to be put into the cupboard going into next season. So that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. As always, click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really like it. You can find my social media by clicking on a channel name. Tell all your friends about Perdemption. Brace yourself, Preds Nation. This team is probably going to go on a three game or more win streak, stopping them from making necessary changes to this team.